Welcome everybody to the Women Behind the Drone Revolution webinar organized by Drone Talks. My name is uh, Lorenzo Murzilli and I will be your host for today's uh, panel. So women of the world want and deserve an equal future, uh, free from stigma, stereotypes and violence. A future that's sustainable, peaceful, with equal rights and opportunities for all. To get us there, women need to be at every table where decisions are being made. For the past several months, the world has been struggling with the COVID-19. Women are at the front from of the battle. As frontline and health sector workers, as scientists, doctors, and caregivers. When women lead, we see positive results. Some of the most efficient and exemplary responses to the COVID-19 crisis were directed by women. And women, especially young women, are at the front front of diverse and inclusive movements online and on the streets for social justice, climate change, and equality in all parts of the world. And yet women under 30 are less than 1% of the parliamentarians worldwide. This is why this year's International Women's Day is a rallying cry for generation equality. And we at Drone Talks have chosen to learn more about this and get inspired by stories of women leaders we admire and have decided to challenge. So I will welcome today to the speakers of the panel, Gemma Alcock, founder, owner, and CEO at Skybound Rescuer, Gozia Daroska, U-Space and UAS Governmental Program Leader for the Polish Ministry of Infrastructure, Andy Fisanich, Head of Humanitarian Programs at Wingcopter, and Esther Kovac, Founder and CEO of Manager and Drone Talks Online. As per the agenda, I will ask our panelists to spend around five minutes each introducing themselves, their company, their work, to kind of set us all up for this upcoming conversation. I would like this conversation to actually be a conversation. So please, uh, I really, we all welcome, you know, questions from the audience. I will be um, moderating the questions. So if you can ask them in the Q&A uh, part of Zoom, you will have them uh, there. And I will take care of, you know, managing the traffic of questions and directing them to the adequate speaker at the adequate time. Uh, so without further ado, I would say uh, I will ask uh, uh, Gemma Alcock to start. Uh, we go in alphabetical order so that nobody is not happy. Gemma, the floor is yours. Oh, hi everyone. Um, great to be here. Um, so my journey into the drone world was uh, triggered by saving her life as a beach lifeguard um, for the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Uh, institution or RNLI as they're more commonly known. It was quite a major incident and I was first on scene. I had to run about 400 meters, swim out about 100 meters to drag an unconscious lady from the water. And then our lifeguard team and I uh, conducted casualty care on this lady that brought her back from being unresponsive and needing assisted breathing to being alive and well. Unfortunately, that lady was trying to take her own life um, and the actions of our lifeguard team that day gave her a second chance which brought a whole new dimension to it it's not exactly our textbook rescue that we train for it was a really profound moment and i knew uh, in that moment that i wanted to dedicate the rest of my career to advancing life saving and the first step on that journey was dedicating my university dissertation to the RNLI, the organization that I was beach lifeguarding for. And my dissertation brief was as broad as find a problem that the RNLI are facing and solve it with technology. And the problem that I found they were facing was they really struggled to find people lost at sea in darkness. It takes them three to four times longer to find someone in darkness than it would in daylight if all other conditions were the same, which could be the difference between life and death in some circumstances. Uh, between 25 to 40% of their annual searches are done in darkness, which is thousands of searches impacted by this every single year. I also found that the asset that helps them the most are the search and rescue helicopters. 
uh, because they're higher height of eyes, so they're higher up, they can see more, so therefore they can search faster. And also the heat seeking um, capabilities of the payload as well. However, during darkness hours, the helicopters take an average of 40 minutes from being requested to taking off. And that's before they even fly to the search area to start a search pattern. And in search and rescue, we have what is called a golden hour, which is one hour to find them and get them to hospital for the best chances of survival. And it, during darkness, the helicopters were missing that window of opportunity. So I wanted to give the benefit of the helicopters to the lifeboat crews, but instantly. And that's when it became drone technology. So my journey into the drone world has been very much research driven and fueled by my passion for lifesaving. And that university project then developed into my company, Skybound Rescuer, which I founded in 2016. So since graduation, I've continued that research driven approach to problem solving, but I've since branched out to look at all forms of drone use in public safety, so not just search and rescue anymore. We work with emergency services that would either want to start or develop their drone capability by researching into best practice with or for them. We also work with the drone industry, which has been anything from hardware manufacturers to software developers to training providers, and everything in between, to create better products and services for public safety. And we summarize our services as we research, we innovate, we educate. So research is at the heart of everything that we do. We uh, innovate with the drone industry and with the emergency services to ensure best use, best products, best services um, for public safety. And we educate the industry and uh, the general public on what drones can offer public safety now and into the future. Our main focus at Skybound at the moment is looking into a future of uh, a network of drone in the box stations in partnership with HeroTech 8. So imagine a future where any emergency service could task a drone on demand and have a drone arrive at an emergency within five minutes of being requested. To be clear, it wouldn't uh, replace the helicopter services. This network would work with and, and support the helicopter services because it has never been, nor will it ever be viable to task a helicopter to every emergency because of the cost. Uh, and yet every emergency, if not most emergencies, would benefit from an aerial view because of the enhanced situational awareness. Um, however, it could someday be viable to task a drone to every emergency because of the significant difference in cost. And blending this network of drones with the helicopter services will improve availability, response times, and resilience of air support that's available to our emergency services all around the world. And that's the future that we're trying to enable at Skybound with HeroTech 8. Thank you very much, Emma. This is excellent introduction. It's, I'm sure it's inspiring many to ask a lot of questions, which I already see flowing in, in, in the, in the Q&A. So if you have questions for Gemma, please start asking. They will not be forgotten by me, I promise. Uh, next, it would be uh, Gosia, if you, you know, if you would like to introduce yourself and, and, and your work, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to this meeting. I'm really pleased uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you and to uh, about the role to talk about the role of women in the drone industry and the drone world. Uh, well, my my journey to uh, to the drone uh, sector, drone industry was uh, quite uh, different to what Gemma was uh, talking about. Uh, after 15 years of uh, conservative career in the legal uh, industry, uh, where I practiced in IT, IP, telecom, and everything which is related to new technologies. I was uh, at, at quite a successful career because I was a partner in a law firm, in an inter international law firm. I, I thought that it was it is uh, the, the, the end of my interest in a classical legal career and I would like to do something uh, which uh, will have an impact to the uh, normal life. Uh, 
and I was uh, I was thinking about working in, in a, an environment uh, um, which 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 will be not concentrated on one topic but uh, will be multidisciplinary. And uh, one day I came across a very interesting projects during my legal career. Very interesting project. Uh, focused on, uh, let's say, like monitoring center, and I, I was analyzing uh, what what to be what should be done to implement this interesting project, and I realized that it's a huge, huge uh, a challenge to to implement such a, a business model because of regulation, because of the maturity of technology, because of stakeholders, and so on, and very short after this uh, this uh, incident, I would say. I was asked to uh, to work to, uh, and also I, I I was operating a little bit in defense area, which is very uh, familiar with drones and uh, drone projects, and I was asked to move to the public administration to uh, to be the project program manager for drone drone program in uh, in, in, the, in the Polish government. It was quite uh, challenging because the role was was new. Uh, it was it was not common in the public administration in my country and also the, the topic was new so uh, my first challenge was to establish credibility of my person uh, as a lawyer in a new environment in public administration in, in uh, and in the uh, aviation industry and also to propose how we should uh, organize the whole ecosystem in a public administration in a, um, uh, in the NSP, in civil aviation authority, and also how to work with stakeholders in our country and internationally. So, uh, well, I, I, I decided to, to, to take this uh, opportunity to, uh, as, as my next step in the, in the career. And I think it's probably the most fascinating, fascinating project I was, uh, I was ever uh, I was ever doing, and uh, I think it's a, this is a, this is a be beginning of a new uh, new journey. And I, I'm very happy to to be the person who is responsible be, be responsible because I feel I'm I'm responsible for for this area. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy to to start something new uh, in the country uh, and also to. Uh, give uh, to, to, to organize the ecosystem for uh, implementing new businesses, not uh, only in one area of, use, uh, the, of the use of drones, but in different, uh, different business models that uh, can be implemented in, implemented in this sector. Thank you, thank you very much, because yeah, it's an interesting jump of perspective, you know, from, from uh, those who are in the field, like Gemma, to those who are enabling those who are in the field, like yourself. It's a very interesting jump of perspective. So if you have questions to, to Gosia, please, again, in the, the Q&A is open. And uh, without further ado, I think I would like to, uh, for Andy, uh, to introduce yourself. Okay, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Andy Pisanich. I'm the head of humanitarian programs at Wingcopter and I apologize that I'm in the dark right now, but I'm actually in Malawi and we had uh, an electric shortage. So I'm trying to stay as close to the lights. I hope that you guys can all see me. Um, yeah, thanks Esther and Lorenzo for inviting me to speak and, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, I think to being able to speak about our career paths when it comes to drones on this specific day, I think is really important. I had maybe uh, a untraditional path towards um, the drone industry, um, but it's always I've always kind of worked at the nexus between economic development, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So I started off at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, my first kind of interaction with UAS was through a, a grant we provided to the University of North Dakota. Um, it was essentially a small 250k investment for them to get an angel uh, fund set up for UAS along with some other industries. Um, following that experience, I, I actually moved to Tanzania where I was working in development focused on uh, smallholder farmers. And although it was extremely rewarding, uh, I realized that I really missed the high tech, high growth um, aspect of the work that I was doing previously. 
Um, that's basically when I linked up with Edward Anderson at the World Bank. He's kind of the drone lead, ICT lead for the World Bank, uh, and he covers most of Africa, and he was doing some amazing work um, with the humanitarian open street mapping team. So they were mapping uh, flood prone areas in Dar es Salaam, as well as doing a, a huge mapping initiative in Zanzibar. Um, and, and he was kind of the brains behind pushing that initiative forward from the World Bank side. Um, so that's when I really started getting interested, interested in how drones could support the humanitarian work that I was already doing. Following that, I, I took a, a lead role in the African Drone Business Challenge, which was um, focused on bringing uh, African drone startups to the African Drone Forum. Yeah, the naming's not the greatest, um, which essentially took place in Rwanda last year. Uh, and it was an opportunity for these 10 startups in, in nine different African countries to essentially have access to the drone industry, uh, key stakeholders. They had an opportunity to be mentored and to pitch for some additional funding. Um, and it was, at that, it was at that conference that I met Tom Plummer, who's the CEO of Wingcopter, and he was looking for someone that had the humanitarian background, but also understood drones. And he brought me on um, initially as his chief of staff, which for the ladies that are out there that are wondering how to get into uh, a more senior role, uh, I would be happy to talk to you about my experience as a chief of staff. Um, and then later on, I migrated as the head of humanitarian programs because it's where my focus and my passion is. Um, and right now, like I said, I'm in Malawi. I'm working on our, our, our project here. It's funded by GIZ uh, and supported by UNICEF. And essentially what we're doing is building out a regional drone network using our electric VTOL drones. So they're landing and takeoff. Um, they require very minimal infrastructure, so it's great for a country like Malawi or some of the more underdeveloped countries. Um, and yeah, we're working on localizing our operations, hiring Malawians. We already have two drone pilots, uh, one of them a female. Her name is Dua, and she's amazing. Um, we actually just featured her today on our Wingcopter website, so you guys should check it out. Uh, yeah, and that's how I'm, I'm here right now, working for Wingcopter and pushing this Malawi project forward. And yeah, again, happy to be here and happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much for this introduction. And let me tell you, you shall not apologize that you are in the dark. This is really as real as it gets, right? So it's, uh, it's really excellent. And, uh, you know, congratulations for what you are doing. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Esther Kovac. Please, Esther, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, for first, thanks for joining. You know, as a founder of Drone Talks, um, I think seeing um, 43 people dialing in to a webinar uh, in focus of the woman behind the drone revolution, that really makes my heart warm. So thank you for being here with us because that means, you know, the, our industry, the people who we're working interested in the topic, which means, you know, we should do it. Uh, regarding my background, I am a safety engineer, um, finished in a university and following on that, I spent, I think, 12, 14 years in multinational companies uh, as a program manager on different initiatives um, on cellular technology. And, um, you know, during these 12, 14 years, I, I recognize that I have, I have a talent in two things. One of them is creating from nothing something. <laughs> and, the, and the other one is uh, to get people together for a good cause. And, um, and I think this, this two talent of mine really paid off um, during the past couple of years, because what basically happened is that um, I work for an association called uh, GSMA, which is the Telecom Association. And uh, we work with like, I think we started with five, six telcos on how to integrate drones to the air traffic management system on cellular. So using cellular capabilities and network on different programs 
and and half for GLT 5G is a game changer. And you know, when I led this program like five years ago, kickstarted, we were like, as I said to you, a few mobile world operators in this incubator hub trying to find solutions. And and when I left one and a half year ago, it was nearly 50 mobile operators working on the same um, initiative. So so we grew rapidly, and and you know the industry grew rapidly. And, and I recognize that there's so much to do here. And if I am engaged only for one company and I represent one view of this whole ecosystem, I cannot really enable my talent and, and I cannot be happy. So I went after my heart. <laughs> I resigned without any job offer or without any uh, you know, safety net. Uh, being in London like one and a half year ago, it was, it was a big step. Uh, you may know that London is a really expensive country, uh, city, sorry. And, um, and, you know, I just jumped in it, I, I think. And, and I was like, okay, I want to create something which has a meaning and I want to get together people. And, uh, and that was the idea behind when I kickstarted. And, um, and I created this, this company called Managed, where we, you know, we run programs for drone companies and, and, and um, we became pretty successful in the field. But, but more and more drone companies um, ask us to lead their PR and marketing initiatives because they recognized there was a gap here. Basically, they had fantastic PR and marketing people in their team, but they didn't know what they speak about. And it's pretty hard <laughs> to talk at an event as a lead of com or or uh, or write even a blog post or an article if you don't know the the subject you you don't uh, know what you write about what's the industry um and and so basically this is how we ended up having a pr and marketing agency as well not just not just uh, not just the uh program uh, management side of the company and why is this really interesting because i think one of my biggest advice to people is be agile, you know, I never been a marketing and PR specialist, you know, I don't even know still what is marketing PR that much as other um, industry experts in a marketing field, but there was this big need in the industry, we hired people in the team. And basically, we combined my expertise with their expertise. And we created this agency. So we reacted on the market needs and, and, and we became an agency who knows what they talk about when they, when they go public. So what happened after that? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's funny enough because, you know, became, we became more and more popular. And I was just one point like, hey, there is this huge push in the industry to know what's going on. And, um, I attended more and more um, high level meetings because that time I became the secretary general of Gutma. So you can involve being a secretary, you can imagine being a secretary general of a global association, the global youth team association means you, you attend then multiple um, stakeholder meetings. And, you know, I attended and I realized people don't know who are behind companies, who are the CEOs of the companies, what drives them, what are the business decisions, why they kind of make these business decisions. And, and why is this really interesting? Because the CEOs of the company's business decisions shape the whole industry. So if they go and lobby in parliament and, and, and regulators, this is going to shape our future. So we kickstarted drone talks where we discussed with C-level executives about, uh, about business, about their companies, about social acceptance. And, um, and basically drone talks academy launched from that organically because we set up courses also for, for people who knew entry in the, in the ecosystem. Because I remember I was the same. I, I was the same five years ago. I didn't know what is UTM, what is UAM. In, in, a, in a workshop, I felt ashamed because, you know, I, I was kind of the newbie who don't know anything. So from that, naturally, we created an academy now as well and drone talks and we informally educate at drone talks. And um, I, think, I think that's all from my side. Thank you, Lorenzo. 
Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, very interesting, you know, ca career evolution. I think you touched many, many areas of the industry, all the way to now influencing everybody and, you know, sharing with everybody the knowledge. Very, very interesting. I see there are a lot of questions already popping into the um, into the Q and A. I'd like to start maybe first with a um, round of curiosities from myself. I will allow myself one question each of you, and uh, and then we can open to to everybody else. Um, I think I, I'd like to start again with Gemma. And uh, I mean, the, que the, the thing that I have is you have been volunteering with Search and Rescue, I understood, for, for many, many years. So you went, like I said, from doing rescues uh, all the way to supporting, you know, the rescuers. Uh, I mean, as a former paramedic myself and volunteer, uh, I know very well that this kind of area is extremely demanding, you know, both physically when you, when you are out there doing the rescues, but most importantly, like mentally, right? And um, what I'm curious about is, I, I would like to understand from you, like, what are the challenges that you are having right now, you know, in, in this very difficult environment? And how are you dealing with those challenges on a daily basis? You, 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 you before highlighted the challenge, for example, of night rescue, you know, and how your whole company has almost was born as a need to cover this challenge. What, what is, however, still now your challenge? What is relevant for you today? What keeps you awake at night? Um, well, I guess uh, the sector that I work in, um, they can be quite innovation adverse um, because we're not just risking money or time when we change things, we're risking lives potentially. So that continues to this day to be a challenge. Um, but that kind of ties into why I've kept that research driven approach. I saw the benefits of taking that approach at university and I think it's enabled us to to kind of have the impact that we've had. Um, instead of coming into it saying like, this is best practice based on my experiences, instead of taking that approach, um, we've made sure that we've maintained a strong level of stakeholder engagement. So we're kind of collating other people's experiences. And we're also taking a data-driven approach as well. So we're looking at the different, what is the data telling us and what are people telling us and working out best practice based on those. And, uh, and that kind of allows us to de-risk innovation in, the, in this space. Um, an example of this, so I work really closely uh, with Essex Police and um, their police search advisors who are hugely uh, skilled and experienced in search um, had come up with this search and rescue tactic for, for the use of drones. And they wanted me to test out the effectiveness of it. And um, it was a great, um, great tactic. It kind of drew on all of the lessons that we use on the ground. Um, but one detail that, um, I, that I highlighted was one of their procedures, they call a halo procedure, which is high altitude, low observation. The, which is basically the idea, it's the initial part of their tactic where they put the drone really high up, see if, uh, what, abnormalities it can see in the area, pick them out, and then they um, observe them at a lower altitude. They were doing their high altitude at 120 meters. And then I looked at the screens that they were looking on. And a person in that frame would be less than a pixel in size on their screen. So actually, even if the missing person was on in that frame, they wouldn't be able to spot it. So we adjusted the height to a height that was 80 meters where the missing person would be four pixels on their screen. And so we kind of took what their best practice experiences are. And then we also applied the data and we kind of met in the middle and, and solved the problem that way. Fantastic, thank you very much, uh, Gemma. Uh, I have a question for, for Gosia because you know we are we are we are looking at the you know Gemma gives us this perspective of you know the, the operator on the ground you know dealing with the police and operating 120 meters and zooming down to 80 meters and I mean as a former regulator myself I know all these altitude limits have been discussed like in the in the rooms of EASA for years you know 120 150 and you were part of this conversation like that ultimately enabled this operation to happen. And I would like to ask you to share some behind the scenes from, as from, a, from a woman which is somehow in charge of innovation, right? Because that's what you're doing in, a, in a, what is inevitable, a conservative environment, which is the Ministry of Infrastructure of a Nation, right? Like, 
how do you deal with this resistance that, that is there and, and how what kind of mechanisms that you employ yourself you know to to shepherd the change through yes uh Thank you for this question. Yes, actually, yes, the Ministry of Infrastructure is quite conservative because usually we are be building roads, not uh, not uh, digital worlds. Uh, well, I, uh, as a lawyer and as a uh, lawyer uh, operating in IP, IT, and R and D, I I knew and and regulatory env environment. I knew that we have to establish a. Uh, something which uh, will help us, uh, an initiative that will help us to to speak uh, and to talk to different stakeholders and to uh, to find new solutions. And this is why we established at CDD, the Central European Drone Demonstrator, which is a, a regulatory and uh, technological sandbox. And thanks to that, I I I, I can invite different uh, different uh, stakeholders and different uh, um, group of stakeholders to speak and to talk on about uh, technical issues and uh, to talk about standardization and how to standardize something and about uh, establishing pilot projects because we decided that we have to establish pilot projects not demonstrators but something else it, it, it is constructed differently uh, to, uh, to, to to create something which is uh, like a, a preparation for a regulatory process because we have to gather and to collect many data from di different sources uh, we are working with uh, public administration with uh, different ministries like the Ministry of the Climate with the Ministry of Agriculture and of the Health uh, and also with the local, uh, uh, local um, authorities. So uh, I organized the, um, the, the group, the, the, the one group uh, which is uh, constructed, which is composed of uh, Civil Aviation Authority with NSP and uh, GZM, which is a metropolitan area, and uh, the port of Gdynia, uh, and uh, also uh, the Research and Innovation uh, Institute. And we organized like a horizontal, horizontal approach to different projects, different pi pilot projects. And now we are inviting uh, different stakeholders uh, like uh, the Ministry of, uh, of the Health and also the, the companies that are conducting and that, that are, they are proceeding tests uh, like a, a drone company with a hospital and we have uh, a number of such projects in Poland. So I have to, I need to have a, a tool to, to, to talk to them with a construct, you know, in a constructive way and to take of these projects what I need to regulate something. So this is an, uh, let's say, innova innovative, innovating approach to regulation. And I'm very happy because the European Commission in the Smart Mod Mobility Strategy established a flagship number seven. Uh, which is an innovation in transport uh, and uh, the European, European Commission recommends and uh, promise uh, to work on the innovative approach on, of implementing uh, transport technologies into the, uh, the business. And the approach is like establishing the, the European test beds and, the, and, uh, the, and uh, pilot projects and also uh, the Commission said that uh, the testing process should be regulated. And I totally agree with that because it's something which is uh, the answer. This, this is the answer to the real problems we are facing. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, solve problems without uh, this uh, innovating, uh, innovative approach. So uh, I'm very happy that I had such an opportunity to establish such pro pro program in Poland. Uh, it was very difficult because it's, it lasted two years to talk to different stakeholders to work together and to establish procedures and uh, uh, and to ask for, for budgets and to uh, define the, pro uh, the, the, the pilot projects and also to design the, uh, the success for each each stakeholder uh, that is uh, involved in our process. So this was my answer and it was uh, based on my experience from my previous life. I hear 
patience, you know, and the painstaking, you know, process of creating consensus among such a wide group of stakeholders, right, that, that somehow form our industry. It's uh, super fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I would like to uh, actually grab a question uh, from, from, the, from the chat, which is uh, directly to Andy, with the hope that the laptop battery is still running over there. Uh, that is like you mentioned this, uh, your, your, your position of, uh, as chief of staff, right? And, and you kind of gave us uh, like a cliffhanger, like if you want to know more, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. And uh, there is um, Christian uh, from the chat, which is asking, yes, what are the learnings or tips that are relevant for the audience? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Sure. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, no, I would say one of the, the chief of staff position is really interesting. Um, and when I kind of agreed to take on that role, it was to have a better idea of, I had never worked at a startup before, but I had supported startups in a number of different ways, whether that was supporting the ecosystem like Accelerator and early, C, early stage C funds or mentoring startups, but I had never had the opportunity to actually work at a startup. So for me, it was like a very holistic opportunity in my career. Um, and I think anytime that you have an opportunity to kind of expand your knowledge base, it's really important. But it also was for me, at least like an opportunity for, for me to realize what I really enjoy and what I really don't enjoy. And I think that you always have to go with what you're most passionate about. So I'm passionate about humanitarian projects. I'm passionate about impact. I'm passionate, passionate about um, supporting and capacity building and really do, like building out our operations. And I'm not so interested in like pitching to investors and doing kind of the, the I, I like business development, but I like it on kind of the project concept side. So it was like, I was working a lot with like helping us uh, get our next round of funding raised and all of that stuff. And it, for me, was just a, it was kind of a reality check that all of these activities working with Tom and, 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 and our uh, other C-suite were taking me away from what I really enjoyed doing. And at my core, what I enjoyed doing is working on our projects. Um, but saying that, I can totally recommend if you're a young lady that's looking for an opportunity to kind of see all the different uh, dimensions of how a company is set up, the chief of staff position really gives you an opportunity to see all types of different levels, including a lot of confidential information about, about how kind of the business is created and how it's pushed forward. So I would highly recommend um, if you have an opportunity or if you're looking at chief of staff positions that it's it's a really interesting, like I said, and dynamic position, um, especially for women that really want to grow and get to that CEO, COO position. It's a good stepping stone for you. This is fantastic advice, I think. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, for Esther, I, I would like to have a, like a, a blend between a question I actually had myself uh, and one which is now popping in uh, into the chat. And the question is like you you have been kind of like a, a drone technology champion, Esther, across like multiple industries, right? You have worked in the telecommunication industry, you worked in governments, you work in UTM, the Global UTM Association, and one of the questions from the audience is like from if I take your, the question is, do, do regulation in the different regions of the world like influence the type of work that can be undertaken? And what do you think is the challenge that stands out? And the reason I'm asking you this question is because again, the like global UTM association, the challenge of harmonizing, you know, different industries, different regulatory environments. How do you go about, you know, tackling this challenge? Oh, it's a great question. You know, there's, there's a million dollar question. Um, so I think, yes. So regulation shapes the future of the industry. Let's face the truth. But we shape the regulation. So and the industry shapes the regulation. So I think we have two options here as an industry. Just, you know, wait and hope things going to work out in our side or uh, actively engage and, and educate, provide input, get involved, share your views. And um, if you do that, uh, you have a chance it will work out for you in your direction, you know? And I'm not talking about only the business direction because 
because business is changing. You know, see me, I'm an engineer. I worked as a, as a, as a secretary general of Gutma, you know, involved in cellular. And now I'm running an educational platform and thousands of thousands of people, you know, watching my discussions with, with C-level ecosystem players. So, so, you know, this is such a young, innovative environment. You need to be able to react on the change, but you should drive the change as you want. And, and I think this is one part. So be agile and, and drive those change. The other side regarding regulation, I think I wouldn't be in, in a chair of Malgorzata or any of the, any of the regulator because it's an extremely challenging um, um, task to do, to regulate an industry what you don't know enough about you know, and, and make the right decision based on your best beliefs. So I think here, again, um, more and more sandbox projects, what we need, more and more commercial operation, what we need. We don't um, necessarily need more pilot projects. So me as an industry leader, leading the Global UTM Association in the past, leading the cellular industry in the past, now leading an educational platform. I don't think so what an industry need is more pilot project. I think we need real life projects. And, and I think this is how we can move forward in regulation wise as well, because if the sandbox project works, we, the regulator is going to have a better understanding how it really works in a real um, airport or in a real city. And, you know, if it really works, they have the regulator able to move forward, you know, so I think we need to make easier the regulator life as well, especially these fantastic innovative regulators like uh, Margot Zata and the others who really try hard, you know, not to block this industry. So, yeah. Well, that's a great, great answer. I, I particularly like the, the call for, for action, right, to the industry. Don't, don't be, you know, in, in receiving mode for, from, for rules and regulation, but actually get engaged and shape it, right? Go out there and tell the regulators what's happening in their field and what you need and shape it. That, that's, a, that's really a good call for action. I think uh, if industry would be in a much better position, it should they really take this advice like at, at scale. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, I think I, I'd like to run a quick experiment uh, uh, during this webinar, if you don't mind. We prepared a, a little uh, poll for the audience just to, to challenge everybody's understanding of, of the industries that we are, we are all operating into, which is somehow aviation. So at last, I would like to ask our, you know, background, uh, you know, all encompassing host here to, to, to start the poll. And um, if that works, or otherwise, yes. And the question is, you can find it in the polling button is, as of January 2020, what is the percentage of women airline captain worldwide? What do you think it is? It's like 2%, 5%. 15% or 28% of the total amount of pilots, uh, sorry, of captains in, uh, you know, global airlines. So I would like to give a couple of, of, of minutes to, you know, to click the different buttons and uh, Karina, our super host, when you have enough answers, feel free to, to close the poll and, uh, you know, give us a, a quick, you know, result uh, for this and, uh, then we go to our maybe final round, final round of questions. Go ahead and vote and click the buttons. And then I will reveal the, the answer. Actually, I should go and vote myself. As you're all voting, if you're not doing that, please go ahead and do it. If you're grabbing a coffee, drop your coffee, vote, and then keep drinking your coffee. And Karina, if we are ready, you can show the results. Let's have a look what we think all together. So we have a 42% thinks is 5% and then some other distribution around that. 
and uh, only six people think is two percent only two people think is 28 percent the actual answer is 1.5 percent and this is as, as of january uh, 2020 which to me was extremely interesting because as you know people think we discuss about you know aviation being uh, as an industry like we are all aviation somehow and being somehow a male dominated industry and it was striking to me that only one percent of women are, are, are captains because these are typical positions that later on result in management or leadership position in other areas of the industry right so if you only have one percent of women there it's no surprise that aviation overall like is, is still considered right now a male dominated industry and some of us face that right and but on the other side i mean what I would like to ask the, the, the panelists, and this is the same question for, for all of you, is like, this is true for what it, traditional aviation, right? And traditional aviation is taking steps in, in order to improve that and get out of this male domination that has seen, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the past years. But you have a privileged perspective from the drone industry, if you want, the, the, the new aviation. And, and I would like to ask you, what is your experience and what is your perspective when it comes to gender equality in the industry that you are you know experiencing these days and i'd like to start again uh, with Gemma. okay um well firstly uh i think i've um for as long as i can remember i've been naturally drawn to activities that have been filled with boys or, or men all of my life you know i i played football when i was younger then i competed in skydiving at university then i beach lifeguarded in search and rescue, then entered the drone industry. All of these things have been filled with uh, boys and men. Um, so I guess uh, joining the drone industry, it didn't deter me like it uh, can do for some women, the fact that there weren't very many women, um, which was great, but also meant that I wasn't fully prepared for the challenges of being one of very few women in a professional setting. Um, in sport, you usually get a bit of banter at the beginning um, for being the only girl, but as soon as you show that you're good at the sport, it's mutual respect. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that in a professional setting. So I, I would say I have two top tips for um, women joining a male populated uh, industry. And the first one is that you will often be instantly underestimated as uh, before you've even begun to speak, um, especially when you start out uh, until you've got, you know, network experience, reputation behind you. I hope it won't always be that way, but that's certainly been my experience and, and that of many other um, women in the drone industry that I've spoken to. It, it won't be by everyone and it won't be all the time. Um, and it won't be consciously by everyone that does it. Um, it's certainly an un unconscious bias for many people. They don't realize they're doing it. But importantly, you've got to ensure that you are not included on that list. So other people's underestimations of you won't hold you back unless you start to believe them. Um, if you let their unconscious bias seep into your own self-worth, self-confidence, uh, ambition, then it starts to mold your career and that's not fair. So you've got to believe in yourself. It's not your gender that determines your capabilities. It's your passion, your work ethic. That's what will enable you to succeed. And if you have those things, then, then you can do it. So you need to believe it and keep believing. Um, and my second tip to help with that is to find a female support network um, to have your back. Uh, there are many uh, amazing communities out there now, like Women in Drones, Women Who Drone, and a few others. Uh, communities of women that are supporting each other. Um, I recommend joining as many as possible because they will be your biggest cheerleaders, I promise you. So yeah, I guess my main bit of advice is to stay strong and keep believing. Um, even if you're the only one that believes um, at the beginning. I remember when I was starting out, so many people were telling me that I would never make a successful company out of focusing on public safety. But now public safety is widely um, stated as one of the biggest industries for drones. And uh, last week I became the second ever recipient of the Public Safety Drone Leadership Award from drone responders. So keep the belief, everyone else will believe eventually because passion, ambition is contagious no matter what your gender is. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much for this uh, passionate answer. You know, you can see from the body language that you 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 totally believe in what you're saying, right? This is this is not a made up answer. Uh, Gosia, what about you? Well, actually, I'm I'm a little bit different uh, from uh, from Gemma and for Andy because I'm in a public administration and in the, let's say managerial position in terms of um, regulation and uh, even the business. So I'm not a technical person. And what I can say, you know, surprisingly, uh, Poland is in the second place in Europe <laughs> as regards the the number of uh, women in a managerial position. Uh, probably you know, you know about that. So. I see a lot of women around myself. Uh, even today, I have an opportunity to meet my drone ecosystem of women. Just for a very uh, for for a moment, we discussed what what we have to do and so on. So, I see a lot of women, but not in a typically technical uh, technical uh, area of drone ecosystem. What I can say is that women are naturally um, naturally. Uh, skilled in uh, creating so because we are it's uh, probably no it's us it's a maybe a stereotype but uh, uh, the men uh, usually fights <laughs> they are fighter they are fight for, for power and what we are doing we are uh, communicating we are trying to find solutions and also we are taking risks uh, risk, uh, which is very typical for this kind of business. Uh, in my in my uh, um, in my position, it's a, a kind of uh, not political, but uh, um, uh, a kind of risk on, on this uh, of the success of the program. Uh, so, uh, so I see this is an excellent place for women, the, the drone ecosystem, and because this is not the place for prima donnas. Yeah, we we have to work together. We have to to exchange we have to because it's it's in in, in our best interest to create to to co-create uh, so and i totally agree with gamma uh, this is my advice to every woman that would like to to be just start and be consequent uh, because uh, there is a little, huge ecosystem of, of girls you can you can communicate you can exchange views if you start this is the place you should you, you can uh, keep and to create something new. So this is my recommendation. Just start and keep going. I think you just created a new hashtag, at least for me, not for prima donnas. I'm going to use it, <laughs> I tell you, this is really good. Okay, Andy, what do you think? Um, the question was gender equality in the drone industry, and the answer is no, it's not in all different sectors. So you're in my opinion, I mean, obviously engineers, drone pilots, uh, even on the business development and sales side, it's not nowhere near 50-50. I think the industry has, has a long way to go. And my advice to drone companies out there that it's all about who you're hiring and doing outreach. Um, and I think it's important that if you're serious about having a, a equal workforce, then then you have to kind of sometimes do the outreach and take the extra step to really find the forums or the networks where there's women in those fields and recruit them. Um, and I think I think it's still up and coming. So I think it's going to take some time. Um, the other thing that I would say to just, you know, the women on the call right now is that when you do have the opportunity to have a seat at the table, it's it's not enough just to like sit there and have the seat and be kind of the check. We have one woman on this panel or we have one woman at the table, like tell them to give you the mic and and talk and be opinionated and be confident what you have to say. You didn't get to that spot in your that position in your career uh, for no reason. So I think what Gemma was saying about have confidence in yourself is the most important thing because sometimes it's it's hard to get that feedback and that uh, I would say like comfort from uh, males as it I think with women were much more motherly or maybe a little bit more encouraging. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to find it for yourself and then for sure speak up because uh, women have a lot to say. And I think if people would listen to us more often, the world would be a much better place. Thank you so much. And I, and I saw Esther, you know, nodding when you said, you know, sometimes you are there on the, sitting on a table just because people want to tick a box. I remember Esther, we were on another panel where you actually made this example. 
So that's a perfect lead, I guess, for your for your answer, right? Not totally. And I would like to say two things. Like I am usually the woman at the table, and the organizers tick the box with me. And how I feel about it, it's great, but we need to start to understand you don't do me a favor to include me in the discussion. That's your benefit because end of the day, we create products for people using in every kind of age, race, sex. And if you don't include the end user of that product, how can you create an ecosystem or a product to them to be able to use? So you're not doing a favor to me as a woman to include me. That's your own economical benefit to include a woman at your table because it's going to drive you revenue because you will be able to sell your own product. So I am maybe a little bit harsh here, but this is kind of my wake up call to the, to the people who are listening because this is your own benefit to include different gender, different race and, and, and diverse uh, discussion. And that's one thing. And the other thing is that, you know, I was labeled million times uh, as too young, too loud, too noisy, uh, too much, uh, you know, as, as a CEO of a company or a CEO of uh, big initiatives, they prefer to hide me because I was too young and, uh, or too female. And, and that's, that's fine. Um, but, but on the other hand, if I would give up on that point, I wouldn't sit here today. So I think that's the other um, message here. You will, you will kind of will be pushed in places where you don't want to be. People are going to treat you not nice, but that's life. You know, <laughs> you cannot stop because it happens. It will happen. Um, but you need to keep going. And, you know, I, I read this great um, quote uh, from, um, from Merkel. And what she said is that if I really want to change, um, and I really do believe the diversity and the change should happen, I should do for it. I should find a position for myself where I can make the change. <laughs> So, and, and she's a counselor of Germany and she believes she makes now the change for women empowerment. I mean, if you believe you can make the change, go and find a position where you can make the change, you know, create one for yourself. Like, oh, if it's not exist, go and create one. And I, I'm seeing everyone's knocking here. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. You know, when, when I was researching for, for, for this panel, I was uh, I found something interesting, for example, regarding the, the business and the revenue opportunities. Like car manufacturers have adapted, for example, their seats, you know, for to uh, to adjust, I don't know, for the for the body shape of women when you are you know smaller shaped or you have special needs. And aviation has not done that, like as an example, right? And, and so it's, it's it's very good to see that like there are industries that are taking this maybe me more seriously. And and Andy made also the point we need to all like the drone as well. We need to all start to go in that direction. I think we are headed towards the the end the end of of this panel. I see still questions unanswered. I think some of them are very specific, and we can possibly answer them uh, offline. You know, when they are directed to to a specific person. And uh, I would like to thank everybody, you know, for, for, for having been with us today, our fantastic panel speakers and our attendees. And I would like to like, leave you, uh, you know, with a, with a small quote just that goes along this line that says, like, some women, some women are meant to change the world, uh, while others are meant to hold it together. And now I don't know who are you uh, from our panelists, with, to which of your group belong but I'm sure you belong in one of the two. So thank you very much. Have a fantastic day, everybody, and um, stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.